country. And the show is a metaphor for that. I try to be an honorable man. I just want to live peacefully with my family. Polygamy is a crime. It's a felony for good reason. It's not about consensual sex. But when it comes to this issue, everybody is silent. It won't be until the federal government works with the state that we can start to break down some of these secret societies. The ones that have been in the media are those that have had some problems. But incarceration at this point is not the fear. We have an attorney general that has told us several times publicly that he is not going to prosecute consenting adults that live plural marriage as long as there's no other crime evident. The lifestyle's illegal, you know. What are you saying, I should pack a toothbrush? Although polygamy is on the books illegal, uh, it's been the attitude of prosecutors for a long time not to prosecute simply for the polygamy. As long as they're not involving any children, and as long as their plural wives are adults, they got absolutely nothing to fear in the state of Utah. In a, an otherwise healthy polygamous family where there's no coercion, no abuse, I don't think that would be the right exercise of prosecutorial discretion. If he was to arrest all of the polygamists and put them in jail, we'd have to build several new jails. It just wouldn't be any way to hold them all. And what would you do with about 20,000 children that would then be less left on welfare? There are plenty of abusers out there that do need to be prosecuted. Are you uh, Warren Jeffs? We're all just very sad that our society has a situation where a man can be sent to prison for being a father. That's very sad. If there was ever a congressional study or a study here in Utah, I think that you would find that the bad far, far outweighs the good. In the state of Utah, it is considered a felony if you are taken into court and prove that you have cohabitated or are guilty of, the, of breaking the bigamy statute. We don't live here on the compound. We're not protected like you are. We could all be put in prison or worse. So we are trying to have this eventually decriminalized. By decriminalizing it, it means that you would remove the criminal penalty from living through marriage or cohabitating or purporting to be married. The government is out to wipe us off the face of the earth. They have been for 150 years. Decriminalization would be wonderful. You had some footage at the rally. Right. Because I was raised with grandparents that went to prison for their beliefs, and so that does get passed on through generations. And I would love it. I would love there to be no fear and more openness about how we believe and how we can portray ourselves. You know, there's a big movement going on right now to decriminalize polygamy, and the public are not getting all the facts. There has been a lot of prejudice, not only with the other students, but as well as um, the administration at the schools. So that's part of the reason why we're trying to get the decriminalization and get away from the intolerance. Uh, you're being held as a fugitive. I hope the Supreme Court doesn't decriminalize it because there's just an awful lot of propaganda from the pro-polygamists. By decriminalizing it, it just means you remove the criminal penalty, but it doesn't mean that you have to get a legal license every time you take another wife. And watching Big Love, that made me think about when Nikki has to fill out that application or when she's filling it out and she says, I got stuck on marital status. I mean, how many times have I got stuck on marital status? How realistic is that? <laughs> I generally end up um, just marking that I'm single or not married because it is true that the state doesn't recognize and usually the places where I'm filling out doesn't recognize my marriage as anything legal. She's not legally married. She has no rights. She has nothing. Only the prophet has the authority to seal these plural marriages. Otherwise, you're committing adultery. But before he will give that authorization, you have to be a full tithe payer. Income from tithing, 
Last month's income from the Sunny K. Yes, but what's the footnote? What they have turned out to be is institutions of power, sex, and money. It's big business. We've had some tremendous growth. 4,000 attended sacrament last week. All the money is in the man's name or in the church's name. And these are 501c3 organizations. So they are capitalizing off of polygamy while their wives and children are using government aid and the taxpayers are footing the bill. If there are two or three polygamists who are willing to come forward and say, hey, we're consensual, we're happy, are we gonna take the position that we're not gonna prosecute them or we should decriminalize it because of these few while there's hundreds of others who are being abused and their lives are being ruined? You ought to thank me for your successes. Because if I hadn't have pushed you out there and you yeah. yeah. you threw me out like I was garbage. Had me get in the back of the pickup, drove me into the city, told me to get out, fend for myself. I was 14 years old. What do you think I did? What do you think I had to do? That's the way it is. Young boys get run off, old men get all the pretty girls. When I left, I was 17 years old. And I left because I had some really good reason to believe that I was going to get kicked out. The reason why I decided to leave is because police harassed us a lot. I mean, every kid's got their own reasons, and that's mine. I had a girlfriend there, which is against basically the law there. Warren found out about it, and I knew eventually he was going to kick me out. After school had ended the next day at midnight, me and my brother just snuck out of the house and ran away. One of my good friends called me up a few days later and he says, they just booted me out, I'm leaving. I says, drop by, I'm packing a bag. There wasn't a whole lot of planning to do with it because we couldn't mention it to anybody, not even our own friends or else it would get out. And we couldn't take any clothes with us. We couldn't show any sign of packing or any sign of difference from everyday life. So we just left everything and walked away. They disown individuals that have gone against their beliefs. They're kicked out because maybe they let their hair grow too long. They're not submissive like they should be. They don't follow the instructions. How's Papa? Busy, of course. He banned music. Good. Within the community, you have to wear your hair a certain way. You have to part it on the correct side. You have to put gel in it. You have to wear long sleeve t-shirts. You can't wear short sleeve. You can't listen to any music. I mean, you can't watch television. You can't be a kid and have all those restrictions on top of you. You have to discover who you are. And you can't do that with those kinds of restrictions. When I started to break out as an individual and voice my own concerns and my own opinions, that's when I came up against the structure. And there isn't room in the structure to be who you are. That's why I had to leave. I didn't want to leave. I had to leave. People say, it's all bad. It's not. There are good things you learn there. You don't have Christmas there. You don't have New Year's. And you don't go swimming with each other. You don't do things that families out here do. And yeah, that's sad. But from day one, you're taught how to work. You're taught ethic, responsibility. You are held 100% and perfectly responsible for your actions. If they make a decision that I'm going to leave the community and they can't go back, sometimes a 16, 17-year-old child isn't going to know what that means next year. They know what it means maybe today. But they look at it, and next year, it's like, maybe I do want to talk to my mother and dad. And they can't. That's been cut off. I really miss my mom and my little sisters and brothers. That is so utterly shameful to tear people away from their families, from their friends, their whole social organization. Uh, I think that itself condemns what these people say they stand for. We let people dress how they want. We let people marry who they want. And there's some stereotypes out there that, you know, you, that your, your leader picks who you marry and that you're put under this thing. Maybe it is true for some, but it's not true for us. There were a lot of kids that they really didn't have a way to get anywhere. And I mean, they'd find people that give them a ride to St. George, but from there on out, they were on their own. 
they weren't old enough and they didn't have enough money to get into a place like me and my friend did. We actually helped a number of these kids, you know, have a place to stay for a little while. But at one time, me and him, we had a two bedroom apartment in the middle of St. George and we had 16 kids sleeping in the apartment. The Diversity Foundation originated about five years ago when the children from the FLDS community, primarily the boys, began to be exiled. Uh, the foundation came forward to assist the kids with their living and their education. I know Shannon Price pretty well because I've interacted with her and a lot of the other boys to get us in school and pretty much just keep us going in our lives, <laughs> pick up where we left off. The guys don't like the term lost boys, and I think for two reasons. They're not lost and they're not boys. Our young men are the average age of 17. The term lost boys, I think, is uh, inaccurate, very inaccurate, because the boys they call lost boys aren't so lost. I don't think I'm lost now. Maybe at one time I may have been, but lost, no. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I want to go. The kids they actually call Lost Boys and the kids that are known as Lost Boys are in school, getting an education for themselves, are stable, you know, they've got a job. Some of them are even living in their own apartments. The important thing to bring out here is the diversity among fundamentalist groups, and there's five or six major ones. The ones that have been in the media are those that have had some problems, whether it's been leaders forcing young girls to marry somebody they don't want to. That is not typical. Being sealed to the prophet is a great honor. Angels will sing for us. Girls were never kicked off. There were a couple that had the nerve to try to leave. Uh, but 90% of the time, they got drugged back, almost literally. We have a floral business, and we had a young 17-year-old girl that was working for us, pretty young gal, and she confided in me that she had no less than, than 11 men come to her and say that was revealed to them that she should be their wife. And you have dirty tricks like this going on all the time. You're the one for me. I'm going to kiss you now. <gasps> Chad. They went after girls like, it was, their life depended on it. And I guess you could say because they wanted them for wives. When my first book came out, I got phone calls from women who had been initiated into sex by their fathers because that was his right as the patriarch. I got calls from women whose fathers would give them to men to enjoy as though it was part of their hospitality. I was just shocked to find out some of the things that went on in other fundamentalist groups. After these women finally get the courage to leave and the help to leave, they have children. These guys try to uh, fight them in court to take the ch children away from them, especially the young girls, because they don't want to play child support. And then a young girl in a polygamous community is like money in the bank. There are rewards for following God's path. They see women and children as nothing more than chattel. Until we recognize this as a country, things are going to continue the same way. There are situations where young women have been forced into marriage, uh, where the women are underage and they've entered into these relationships. And all of that, the state, I think, has been pretty aggressive about prosecuting, and we're seeing one of those prosecutions taking place right now with chefs. It doesn't mean that because one polygamist does something that's very inappropriate, that all polygamists are in the same boat. So we do resent the fact that we're all painted with the same brush by a lot of people, and that's why we have decided to speak up to make that distinction that we're not all alike. The hunt for polygamous leader Orlean Abbott continues for trafficking underage girls across state lines. Stupid, greedy perverts. They're going to ruin it for the rest of us. My partner and I uh, were driving back from a family Christmas in Nebraska, and we were tossing around ideas, which we do often, about screenplays or television shows and Mark was uh, pitching some ideas and he said why don't we do a show about polygamy and I said yuck 
no one's going to want to watch a show about polygamists. It's just not, it's not attractive. And he said, I'll, I'll prove to you that it's something that people would want to watch. A great shot of her up the stairs, of his death. Yeah. In 2001 and 2002, when we were first batting around ideas of this, it was the reascendancy um, of the conservative religious right. There was a lot of chest thumping going on about what is a family, what should be a family. Action. And that is the environment that this idea was born out of. Sound rolling. And action. What are you doing here? I'm talking to my brother. He saw it as a way of exploring family through the lens of this subject, you know, that it wasn't just a show about polygamy, but it was a show about family. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Try and read the jury. Okay. Nikki on the phone, dressed a little more compound than we're used to seeing her. There's no sleep to be had. We know when each script needs to be done. We know when the last chance is to get the last tweaks into a script before and during its shooting. So there, there's a holding on process to the very last minute before you let go and move on to the next one very quickly. I got here as soon as I could. Where's Bill? We'll read the script, and uh, we'll do a table read with the cast and stuff, and then definitely in terms of the crew and the cast, it's definitely a much more family feeling this year. It's been nice. You and Bill don't love me for me. I'm just a baby factory, aren't I? How could you think that? I'm going to be the ugly pregnant wife from now on. I'm going to be a fat and slovenly and have stretch marks, and I'm going to smell like crouses and sour milk. <laughs> Sweetie. She can be so vulnerable and soft, and Chloe's so funny, and, mm. uh, you know, Marjean, Ginny is so effervescent, and it's so fun to kind of write to their strengths. Are we going to be in another house? Yeah. We're building it. We're building it. Mm. Cass has questions, and everyone, you know, asks questions, but I have to say, this year, they've been really strong out of the gate. The Henriksons are really interesting because they're not like a lot of these compound cult-like communities where people can really, oh, that's a little too weird for me. Every once in a while, one of the writers will be like, screwed up how these people are living. But for the, <laughs> for the most part, um, you, you get past the concept, and then you're just trying to write the human experience you know, of people who are really, really just trying to make your way. So the only way to write it is the way in which you identify with them. These people are just like, you know, your, the, like, you know, your average person next door. They're just like your next door neighbor. We all bring in stories about our own marriages or our own families and our own dysfunction and then just apply it to this. No, I'll be paying in cash. They've got a real yeah. handle on the ideals of polygamy and portraying that on the screen. There's some one-liners that stick out like, well, this isn't junior high and these aren't your little sleepover girlfriends. Happy anniversary. Uh, how, how many years? Six. 16, 19, 19. A lot of the material in the show is so shocking because it's portrayed in such a normal way. When I had Albie, he became my great uncle and I became his great, great grandmother, which of course makes me my own grandmother. As Mark and Will said early on, they, after they did years and years of research, they said, there is no end of the stories that we can come up with. In the last episode of season one, Barb has been nominated for Mother of the Year. She goes to the ceremony thinking she has a really great shot at winning, only to have everything come crashing down around her. I would like to speak with someone about this evening's ceremony. She just got carried away at the opportunity of being Mother of the Year. Are you engaged in polygamy? Good heavens. She felt that she had ruined her family. What's happening to my wife? She's been disqualified. Why? That would be a matter for you to discuss with her and your other wives. For us, the idea that Barb has been exposed could mean other collapse of the entire universe. We don't really have any perspective how it's going to affect us or anyone else. We want to know what's going to happen to them. We want to know if they're going to be prosecuted, if Bill's stores are in jeopardy. What's going to happen with Barb psychologically as a result of this horrible trauma that's happened to her. She's always been on the fence about polygamy, but I think at this point she wonders if, if she can do this at all. The life we've chosen leads to eternity, but yes, there are consequences. We are not in eternity, Bill. We are here in Sandy, Utah, and I don't think I can live this life in Sandy, Utah. Can this family make it? Can they negotiate change? Can they find a different way 
of living together that serves everybody when it has stopped to serve some members. Barb, I don't know if I can be married to Nikki and Bill if I'm not married to you. Her constant conflict is, do I want to be in this family? Is this untenable for me? And the sort of desire and wish to go back to the way it was with she and Bill. You know who did this? The First Lady's office either doesn't know or is protecting the identity of the person who did. Well, if you knew, could you tell me? <laughs> He's going to find out who did this, no matter what it takes. Bill has slowly sort of redefined his vision of himself, which is to be, for lack of a better word, an out polygamist. Work hard, play by the rules. I can't go backwards. It's not the life I was called to lead. Meanwhile, he's feeling that he's left his family exposed, and he's been kind of hubristic. And the idea of Hendrickson Home Plus and his face on there, and he's now realizing if they get completely exposed, in the community that could, his businesses could fail. You know what the stores are worth now? Well, just imagine what they'd be worth if we were really exposed in the public eye. Now Bill's very keen on trying to find a new direction for the family, a new place to put the fortune. And he starts getting into a new business this season, which is kind of morally questionable, particularly for him and his beliefs. What if there was a way we could take the pressure off our families from all the hiding we've had to do to protect the stores? Hiding is part of our lives. As an audience member, I, I will find Bill's actions this year terribly greedy and, and terribly haphazard. I'm not sure that I want to get involved in this revenge fantasy of yours. What part of a revenge fantasy doesn't appeal to you? There's some guns that are going to go off this year. It's going to take on some, uh, some malevolence that people maybe not expect from the show. Your father sent this to you for your protection. There's been a, a poisoning and attempted murder and conspiracy that needs to be worked out this year. You conspired with Lois Hendrickson. And who else? Who orchestrated the attempted murder of me? She loves Joey so much. So much of her acting out has to do with holding on to me, I think. What, what are we dealing with here? How many times has she done this? Besides Dad and Elby? Just once. She was protecting her family. You do realize this. <laughs> I'm very excited about season two of Big Love. You can look forward to a lot of trouble. Serious trouble. Come on, let's go. I don't want to give too much of the plot away here. It ends in a satisfying and thrilling way. How's that? I can't tell you because then that would spoil the surprise. The stakes are going to get a little higher this year. So much else happens. I don't know how much you're supposed to say. I don't know how much I can tell you. I don't know how much I should say. I don't know how much I can say without giving it away. I'm not sure how much we're allowed to reveal. <laughs> but I don't think I was supposed to talk about that.